Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the Medfield College Film Society. I am Jeff Crawford, and I am joined by my esteemed society members with Mr. President Robert McSwain. Starting off, Robert, how are you doing? I am great. I have my detonator handy. I'm ready to raise some buildings and get this underway. Man, if only. I wish I could take take out some buildings, some classic architecture. Get it out of here. Uh, we're going to go down to uh, where there is, you know, not too much classic architecture, the wilds of Central Florida. Mr. Michael Crawford, how's it going? I'm cracking into a, a boiled lobster, as they say. Uh, enjoying that down here. Um, yeah, back in the swamp, you guys are reporting cold temperatures and snow, and I'm stuck with 80 degrees. So it's brutal, man. Hmm. Uh, watch out for those lobsters. They can be uh, used as weapons for sure. So I hear. Uh, our mountainous correspondent, Mr. Andy Brown. How's it going up there? What the? <laughs> <laughs> Timely. <laughs> uh, I've been watching the Super Bowl, like old Super Bowl commercials. So well, there you go. Uh, <laughs> getting ready. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm doing great. Hope you guys are. <laughs> Uh, So, if you've listened to our last episode, you know what we're doing. But if you haven't, you should go back and listen to the last episode. But we are in the midst of a four-part Herbie series. What is next in that lineage, Michael? Oh, wow. We are hitting the road again to the streets of San Francisco with the 1974 Disney classic Herbie Rides Again. Directed by Robert Stevenson, produced by Bill Walsh, also written by Bill Walsh, based on a story by Gordon Buford, both of those men Disney legends, starring the first lady of the American theater, Helen Hayes, as Mrs. Steinmetz, Uh, Ken Berry, TV's Ken Berry, as Willoughby Whitfield, Stephanie Powers, boat nicking her way to our hearts as Nicole Harris, Uh, Keenan Wynn, the great Keenan Wynn as Alonzo Hawk. And John McIntyre is Mr. Judson, who got billing over Keenan, and I'm not sure why. Wow. <laughs> it's not here, buddy. Yeah, not here. No way. Uh, also featuring a stellar score by George Bruns. Always great George Bruns. The workhorse of the Disney studio at this time. Uh, as we have said in previous episodes, Michael, this was a frequent watch in our household. I don't know why, but yes, it was. (laughs) Well, it was the the rules of childhood where whatever you manage to tape off of TV becomes the thing you watch over and over again. So we watched this one way more than the original Love Bug. This one and Monte Carlo uh, both watched more than the original. And I hadn't seen this in a long time. And man, it came flooding back hard every frame of it. That is right. That is exactly right. I came into it almost cold. I, I watched it as a kid, and I had very vague memory of it. So, what a treat for you. How lucky. I wish I could step into your shoes. Wipe my memory and start over again. <laughs> step in for the – see it again for the first time. I was really into Hot Wheels, and I remember sitting with the Volkswagen Hot Wheels and watching this uh, watching this movie, Matchbox. Movie. Yeah. yeah yes, sir. Great. Be the Red Knight, get a car to be the Red Knight. Uh, anyway, we'll get to that. Yeah, we would. Forgot about that. <laughs> yeah, good times. The Red Knight. So, Michael, this movie has a lot of the same production team, but uh, somebody's missing. I wonder what's up with that. I have never been able to find a reason why Dean Jones was not in this. Um, Obviously, I... and. It suffered as a kid. Obviously, I like Monte Carlo better because Dean Jones is in it. And uh, Dean Jones not in this was always a huge letdown. We don't get the continuing tales of Dean Jones and uh, Herbie. I don't I don't know. Uh, I mean, he was still doing stuff for Disney at this point. He must have been busy with... Ka- uh, well, no, Cut from Outer Space was Kim Berry. He must have been busy with uh, <laughs> Million Dollar Ducks yeah. or something. So, I don't know. But, uh, yeah, sorely missed... Hard to say. And uh, we know, Andy, you have not seen any of the Herbie movies. That's correct. First time through this one. Yep. What, uh, give us a take on this. 
Well, you know, kind of like what you guys have already said, I um, I was expecting a different sequel, and uh, and I think when we get into it, you'll kind of can tell that by my uh, by my write up of Act One, but uh, <laughs> I uh, it was okay. It, I, I take it back; it wasn't very good, but it wasn't, <laughs> <laughs> but it wasn't terrible. It just wasn't very good. Well, once again, we were back channeling Jeff and I and speculating about. <laughs> <laughs> your take on that. <laughs> I was pretty sure I could predict. Well, yeah, it wasn't real pretty. Yeah, it was pretty easily predictable uh, as as it as it as the uh, the plot unraveled. But we'll get into that. Yeah, I mean, it was nowhere near as good as the first one. Uh, this is definitely one of those cases where the sequel does not live up to the original. Yeah, I mean, I always thought the first one feels like a real movie. If that makes any sense, I'm like, okay, that's a real movie, and this one is very much of the sort of the factory of the Disney factory and a lot of just like gags strung together kind yeah. of, it was a cash grab. If very, like. very Gus yeah. kind of uh, moments here and there. So. <laughs> yeah. A lot of big um, sort of set piece gags, but I will have to say that it was hard for me, to, you know, taking notes, watching this, not to like quote literally every line that Alonzo Hawk says. Yes. Yes. Because there are a lot of lines in this movie that I didn't realize till we were rewatching it, till I was rewatching it. Things that I quote to this day. Yes. That I had no, that I had totally forgotten were from this because of like bizarre, bizarre lines. It so is. That was a lot of fun. Very <laughs> imprinted on our uh, DNA. I don't it, know why. but It reminds me of growing up and discovering the Beatles and then realizing, oh, they, they did that song. So Alonzo yeah. Hawk and the Beatles. So that's, you know, there's a connection. There. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, shall we get into this movie? Let's do it. All right. Well, let's get into the world of Herbie Rides Again. Andy, you're going to start us off. Take us there. It's DBBV time, folks. That's right. <laughs> Distributed by Buena Vista. And hark, what's that sound? Oh, it's that groovy shagadelic Herbie theme song in Walt Disney's Herbie Rides Again, the follow-up sequel to the Smash family favorite movie, The Love Bug. Now, it's been a few years since we last saw our beloved characters, and I know we're all just dying to find out what Jim, Carroll, and Tennessee have been up to, and of course, Herbie. <laughs> But uh, so when we last saw Jim and Carol, they had just gotten married. And so based off of that and the timing of when this movie came out, it would make sense for this sequel to have something to do with them. Probably having yeah, kids or I, the I like, think, right? Yeah, so. Sense, yeah. yeah. Oh, 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 I know. I know the movie's going to start out with Carol being pregnant and about to give birth while Jim and Herbie are speeding her to the hospital. And, and, and then Tennessee is in the back seat trying to keep Carol calm. By spouting Tibetan proverbs. That would make a lot of sense, right? Right? Yeah. I think so. Uh, you've <laughs> sold me, man. Where were you in 1973? Let's just, let's just go with Andy's story. <laughs> Unfortunately, that isn't the case. And like my expectations, the movie literally opens with things crashing down to earth. The first two and a half minutes are just shots of buildings being torn down as a giddy but familiar old man watches on from the back seat of his chauffeured car. And even at time, he pushes the detonator himself. But that's not just some ordinary eccentric rich old white man. It's Alonzo Hawk. That's right. The Alonzo Hawk. That Alonzo Hawk from the absent minded professor. I tell you, I, I cannot state how happy I was. I had no idea it was in this movie. So I could not say how happy I was when I saw him. And I was like, oh, I love this guy. Yeah. Uh, so it, good. It was so it's good. one of the, I mean, one of the best opening title sequences I can think of of all yeah. time. Well, this, you know? yeah. Andy points out the, the symbolism here of it all crashing down. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of a racing montage from the first one, we get a wrecking ball montage. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, anyway, like I said, Alonzo Hawks in this movie, what in the world is he doing in this movie? Well, I'll tell you what, He's building shopping centers. That's what he's doing. And boy, does he want those old buildings gone. He makes the slice across the neck motion as one building after another collapses, making room for yet another Hawk shopping center. Uh, 
but I guess all that sitting and watching buildings collapse wore Alonzo out because the very next shot is him in a flowery shirt being chauffeured around Rome. <laughs> well, taking, I will say this yeah. before we get to Rome. I could watch probably 10 minutes of just Hawk blowing up buildings like on YouTube. Like, I think, <laughs> like, if there was a, a YouTube channel of just the Alonzo Hawk pushing the plunger on, <laughs> on buildings, <laughs> I'd be there. I'm like giggling weirdly. Yes, and enjoying I, it. <laughs> so, some of these buildings are huge. I mean, yes. massive. It's just kind of amazing. To watch. I was hoping our historian could, could clue us because there's one like big, like white, like ornate, like hotel or something, towering hotel that goes down. Like, I mean, yeah, I wondered what, like, I what like, all those were. I mean, obviously it's stock I, footage, but uh, yeah, I don't know any of them, but there were some really nice buildings in there. And then yeah, the, you know, some nice stock footage too. Yeah. It was, yeah. Th- 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 yeah there's one, I think there was like a, a building, like, like sandwiched, like maybe four feet on either side and they took it down, leaving the other two standing. I was not, I mean, it's impressive. It's always impressive, but. Maybe not to be blowing up San Francisco. They don't seem to be too, <laughs> yeah. not real groovy about that out there. But right. um, Yeah. So anyways, yeah. So Hawks now, he's in, he's in Rome and he's being chauffeured <laughs> around and he's taking in the sights when he suddenly sees the Roman Colosseum and uh, shocks his Italian driver by exclaiming that it would be a perfect site for one of his shopping centers. I love his uh, shirt in this. <laughs> yes. It's a nice shirt. Yeah. It's like a Hawaiian shirt, kind of. But did anyone catch who the, the cab driver was? Oh, oh yeah. Okay. yeah. I was going to say. Well, I recognized him. Uh, I mean, Vito's, was it Vito Scotti? Yes. And uh, from I recognized him from The Godfather. That's where he it jumped out. So he was the baker. Really? Yeah, he was the baker uh, that did a scene with Brando. His <laughs> future son-in-law I was did. trying, it was being deported, and he asked The Godfather to... Uh, you know, kick open a few doors for him, and in exchange, he he baked the, the the wedding cake for the um for the wedding ceremony. Well, that's funny because where I was going with it <laughs> is uh, he's the who took the chicken guy yes. from a Herbie movie that's two movies away. Stay tuned. So stay, stay tuned. tuned for more Vito Scotty. And this, I love that in the same decade he goes he does uh, Godfather. And uh, who took my chicken? I mean, that has to be his star turn, though. You know, not the Godfather, but the who took my chicken. I would think. Yeah. Well, I didn't. Uh, he also was in the Andy Griffith show. Andy, I don't know if you saw that. If you recognized him? No, yeah. I didn't. I was looking at his uh, his, his list, and I mean, he's done a ton of work. I mean, just yeah, he's in everything. I mean, he's in everything. And of course, he had uh, he was a yeah, it was just a bit part in, in the Andy Griffith show. Hmm. There's also a line here that's one of those lines that yes. I always quote without knowing why, which is when he's talking about the Coliseum, he says, plenty parking, too, <laughs> <laughs> which is a comment I've made. He said that a many lot. Times. Yes. Yeah. Um, also, I mean, that's it for this. It's just, yeah, that's, that's just all right. to blow up. It's <laughs> just in there for that gag. That's it. So, yeah. So since Hawk is in Italy, he's probably going to go blow up the Leaning Tower of Pisa next, right? <laughs> yeah. But what? Oh, come on, movie. Why are we back in San Francisco? What happened to the Hawk versus the Italian story? So weird. Yeah, it was cutting room floor, man. There was a whole act about a Hawk in Italy, but it uh, got taken away. That would have been great. Yeah, so yeah, we're back in San Francisco, which is the headquarters of the Alonzo A. Hawk Wrecking and Building Corporation. And they are revealing to the public their latest project, the world's tallest office building, Hawk Plaza, which definitely has a Tony Stark slash Stark Tower vibe to it. Oh, yeah, for uh, sure. And I think about this building a lot. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it definitely has. Well, it's 130 stories of man-made glory. Yeah, it's just it's etched in my mind somehow. I don't know why. <laughs> yeah, there definitely seems to be some sort of tie into my my own personal struggles looking at that, that tower. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, I'm referring to a certain tower in uh, New York City uh, that bears the name of its builder. Um, but... Oh yeah, well of course. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's the beginning of many, uh, many comparisons there. All right. Well, Hawk's giving a, a heartwarming speech, which could mislead one to think that he's not as cold of a person as he used to be, but then suddenly blast the freeloaders for coming and drinking all of his booze. <laughs> and then Hulk takes a phone call from his builder who asks when 
Hulk wants them to start digging and building his new masterpiece office building. But then suddenly Hulk realizes that there's still a single building standing in the way of his dream structure. But it's not just any building, but it is a firehouse building. But could it, would it, is it possible that it's the same as the one that Jim in Tennessee lived in? Mm, I don't know. We'll have to find out. I love the gag where they pull the <laughs> they pull the model of the skyscraper up, and there's a model of the firehouse right underneath. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I think it's That's yeah, it's scaled like uh, detailed model. Like. <laughs> yeah. I I really hope both of those models are in the archive somewhere. I really hope they are. I don't mean to poke amazing. a hole in the plot here, but uh, that that tower is not going to fit on that lot the way they had it i mean just I mean, uh, <laughs> also it's a tiny tiny thing if it's as big as the uh the firehouse it's one tower it's about yeah. the same yeah. size um uh, the other thing i'd like to mention before we move on is the guy who is doing like the voiceover of the pitch is just yes. It's some of my favorite, like, how did it happen? You ask. And then he like asks the people to come down to the lobby where a scroll awaits you. (laughs) (laughs) Where a scroll awaits you. Uh, Also the line about uh, bringing a tear to Hawk's flinty old eye is another one that uh, I still Mm. quote. So Hulk lashes out at his team of lawyers who say that they couldn't get old lady Steinmetz to sign the final papers because she doesn't trust them. And Alonzo agrees and decides he needs someone else to talk to her. Someone so innocent and helpful and dumb that anybody would trust them. And cut to Willoughby Whitfield, played by TV's Ken Berry, who's Hawk's nephew and is sitting in the waiting room waiting to meet with his uncle. We find out that Willoughby is Hawk's sister's kid who just finished law school back east. And when Alonzo hears the news about his nephew, he immediately knows he has found his man and wants to see him right away. So, yeah, so this is Ken Berry. So we're going, you know, you had already mentioned Andy Griffith's show. We got Ken Berry, who is a tie into with the Mayberry RFD. Uh, But that's not the only Andy Griffith show connection after the ones that you already mentioned, Robert. One of the lawyers is played by Dan Tobin, who's he was the second lawyer, the, the second main guy lawyer. And Dan Tobin was Gentleman Dan Caldwell in the Andy Griffith Show episode, Andy and the Gentleman Crook, whose famous saying was, on my word as a gentleman. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, wow. <laughs> These lawyers crack me up. They're all wearing white carnations. It just seems like the sleaze is even... <laughs> classy sleep how about hawk's office i mean this is ridiculous oh man i mean just it's got those like egyptian a statues and then it's, like, there's a whole big open area like there's like a what, like a 40 by 40 foot <laughs> it's like, like a gym yeah. gymnasium like size <laughs> there's nothing in it it's just it's just a big open space in front of his desk <laughs> The gold H door handles. I thought I thought his desk was way too small for that giant room. It's like kind of a normal desk. Absolutely. Yeah, like, he'd have a bigger desk. If for you're sure. gonna go all, it's out, not centered. Just go all out, yeah, it's not yeah. centered. Ah, I do on. like the H door handles. That's a nice yeah, touch. It's a real <laughs> hawk touch, yeah. as he would say. Mm. Yeah, Robert. To your point, this is all starting to ring a little bit too familiar to uh, the modern day. Yeah, the, 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 uh, I put certain, my notes to the irony here is just dripping. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I never even made that connection. That's good. Yeah, just, I, just I, a little I bit. Just a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Oh wow. <laughs> yeah. So Hawk invites in the nervous Willoughby, who presents him with the is it Furs Law yeah. College Humanitarian <laughs> of the Year award. I laughed at this Furs Law College. Which I googled yeah. and couldn't find anything. <laughs> That's a shame. <laughs> it's not a real thing, obviously. But it's played like it should be a joke, but I don't get it. Yeah. And, and Willoughby really admires his uncle because, turns out, Hawk's sister idolized him and raised her son, telling him how wonderful and great her brother was, and he would often send them California fruit at Christmas. <laughs> recognizing his opportunity alonzo hires and convinces willoughby to go and persuade mrs steinmetz to sign the building over to him which he enthusiastically agrees to and cut to the firehouse because yes indeed it is the same firehouse that we saw in the love bug overlooking the san francisco bay but it's now surrounded by building rubble uh but we do see that familiar vw bug sitting out front so 
I wonder who that could be. I, I, I have to interrupt here. I'm sorry before we go further. There are a couple <laughs> I know what of, you're going to say. <laughs> I, I mean, there are a couple of things <laughs> from the monologue that Hawk gives to Willby at his... Uh, uh, first, he, he loves that he's somebody who knows how to use juice properly, yes. Yes. which I like. He also tells the story of Mrs. Steinmetz and says that she rolls drunks and teaches small children to steal, which was the first I had ever heard the phrase rolling drunks. So that was that was fun. This monologue is priceless. Uh, And when he's talking about the building and all the features. For the building uh, for helpless old people. Helpless old people. For helpless old people. Yeah. Yeah, that has everything. Uh, uh, has the Rudolph Valentino Seshu Hayakawa movie. Yes. <laughs> now, Seshu Hayakawa, who was in Swiss Family Robinson, weirdly enough. Uh, but uh, as a kid, I knew who Rudolph Valentino was, but I had no idea what Seshu Hayakawa was. So I was always super bewildered by that line. And Jeff and I would say it all the time. Yes, we would. Uh, yes, we would. Not knowing, not knowing what it even meant. remotely what it meant. <laughs> and I also like the uh, the machines on each hall that will give you everything from pizza to hot chili. <laughs> Man, that's... <laughs> Old ladies love pizza and hot chili. They, and they would also have a hobby center. I mean, it's kind of selling me on it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm so there. Yeah, for real. <laughs> Oh, the Rudolph Valentino Sesha Hayakawa movie. <laughs> so, yeah, we're back at the firehouse, and Willoughby arrives via taxi. And when he gets out, he says, Isn't it breathtaking? In admiration of his uncle's new Hawk Plaza building site, just as the cab driver says, Yeah, that guy Hawk ought to be hung. And drives <laughs> off. That's pretty good. That's a good line. Willoughby dismisses the negative talk and rings the door buzzer of the building and the sweet old lady mrs steinmetz answers the door and willoughby introduces himself saying he'd like to discuss some business with her but unfortunately the volkswagen beetle that was sitting out in front has now rolled onto his she- on excuse me has now rolled onto his toes now that sounds like something herbie would do and you know what it is herbie. hey well, at least we got somebody back yeah <laughs> Mrs. Steinmetz scolds Herbie, saying he's always trying to protect her, and so she invites Willoughby in, and saying that she has to humor Herbie because he used to be a famous racing car, but his driver went off to Europe to drive foreign cars, and so now oh. Herbie is a little sensitive. Well, he ought to be. Hate ah. this backstory. Hate that backstory. Why would Why would well, Jim Bell on Herbie? Herbie wins okay. every race. But you know what? After watching the love bug and seeing how ridiculous Jim can be, I kind of can believe it now. Uh-huh. I used true. to be like, that's so <laughs> unbelievable because Herbie wins every race. But we saw what happened to Jim. Yeah. Jim uh, got some pretty yeah. s- stiff denial and he clearly wants to, uh, you know, he uh, lusts after European cars. So he got a uh, wandering eye. It's true. But I mean, come on. How are you going to do that to Herbie again? I Now I'm just upset. Because, Jim, mm-hmm. what's wrong with you? So, yeah. Well, yeah. So, you know, now they're finally starting to give us a little backstory and some information about where Jim, about Jim's whereabouts. And it's certainly better than other much higher paid screenwriters saying stuff like, somehow Palpatine returned. <laughs> <laughs> the dead speak. <laughs> yeah. Mrs. Steinmetz goes on about the old firehouse when a sentient music box wow. starts playing the tune do not trust him gentle maiden Man, what a cool organ that thing is great yeah, yeah i wouldn't yeah. mind one of those in my house yeah she says the music box is a friend of herbie's and so is old 22 the cable car who sits <laughs> out back ding, ding. i felt like old 22 was uh right outside of mr rogers house it's gonna have that vibe of a Yes. The sound mm-hmm. stage with the Carolina Blue yeah, the wall. AstroTurf. Yeah, yeah. an AstroTurf. That's right. <laughs> I mean, it turns out Mrs. Steinmetz has a sentimental attachment to the firehouse because she got married there, and her late husband, Captain Steinmetz, of the San Francisco Fire Department, one of the heroes of the Great Fire. I, I kind of want to hang that, that portrait of the captain over my mantle myself. That's a good oh, one. Yeah. I want that painting. That I want that painting so yeah, bad. It's so amazing. I'm going so to stick with the Radigan one, but uh, you all can have that one. <laughs> yeah. That should be ab- above a fireplace somewhere on the park. Yeah, it definitely needs to be a, a Easter egg somewhere on one of the theme parks. You're right. 
Well, Willoughby tells her that he was sent there by Mr. Hawk, and that changes Mrs. Steinmetz's demeanor, saying that Willoughby has such a nice face compared to those other ruffians Hawk usually sends around. And when Willoughby offers her a check, Mrs. Steinmetz says that she doesn't know anything about money because her nephew, Tennessee Steinmetz, is the one who takes care of her. Ah. And he used to live there but had to rush off to Tibet because his guru got sick. <laughs> there See, you that's, go. that's pretty tidy. Yeah. Pretty tidy. <laughs> mm. You don't hear about gurus getting sick, you know? Yeah. I feel like they would no. heal themselves. No. Well, I guess while Tennessee was away, Mrs. Steinmetz cleaned up the place because it no longer looks like a bachelor pad, yeah. which I was kind of disappointed. Except for that organ. That organ was pretty, pretty sweet. She doesn't have a blowtorch. <laughs> or Irish coffee. Uh, Mrs. Steinmetz explains to Willoughby that Tennessee studies oriental philosophy, and that's how he knows things have an inner life, like wind and rain and traffic lights and can openers and flowers and little cars. And that's how he and Herbie became such great friends. But Mrs. Steinmetz didn't have to study Oriental philosophy like her nephew did. She could talk to Herbie right off, which is also convenient. At this time, a global airline shuttle van pulls up to the firehouse and drops off a beautiful younger lady, Ooh. Nicole Harris, Said that right. played by Stephanie Powers, who appears to be a flight attendant. Sure and what is. happens next is one of the best scenes in the movie. I <laughs> yeah, agreed. agreed. As Nicole enters the firehouse, she hears Willoughby talking about Mr. Hawk and and Mr. Hawk's offer, and Mrs. Steinmetz introduces the two, and Will Nicole says, how do you do? And instantly just hauls <laughs> off and slugs Willoughby across the child, knocking him to the floor and prompting the music box to play some cheerful music. Yeah. Classic. Great, great. One of the all-time great uh, intros of a Disney character, I think, uh, we'll ever see. Cold cock and and she sells guy. it, yeah. too, man. She clocks him good. Oh well, yeah, because you know while he's recovering, we find out that Nicole is she's like a tough cookie because she, she is indeed a flight attendant and works for the airline. And, and just last week, she knocked out a hijacker with a bottle of California <laughs> wine. <laughs> she was like a, timely. Yeah. A Cali what a great backstory, yeah. man! That's awesome. Back in the day, the the uh, hijacker gag was pure gold. That was a go to. Right. That's right. Nicole is Mrs. Steinmetz's live-in caretaker, and she sends her on up to her room so that she can get rid of what she thinks is another one of Hawk's goons. But while trying to convince Nicole to talk some sense into Mrs. Steinmetz, Willoughby says that he thinks her goofy story about Herbie is a sure sign that Mrs. Steinmetz's middle state is coming apart. Ooh, not so fast, my friend. Yeah, well, that prompts Nicole to take Willoughby for a spin and in Herbie and to show him that it's not goofy at all. At first, Herbie behaves himself, much to Nicole's frustration, but he soon reveals his true self when Willoughby calls him unattractive <laughs> by pop popping a willy and begins speeding through traffic until Willoughby apologizes. And once Herbie comes to a stop, Willoughby still doesn't believe the stunt was Herbie, and he thinks it was just Nicole playing a trick on him. Well, that's when Nicole offers to let him drive to prove that it wasn't her, and he ends up calling Herbie stupid-looking again, and which, once again, ruffles Herbie's feathers, sending him shooting down the road. And this time, Herbie is really mad because he drives them across the Golden Gate Bridge and down the Pacific Coast Highway to a chicken tournament jousting competition oh, out in the middle of man. nowhere. That's right. I said chicken tournament jousting competition. You mean uh, ye chicken tournament jousting competition? Uh, yeah. Yes. Ye <laughs> chicken <same>. tournament. <laughs> Was man. this a thing? Surely not. <laughs> This is the equivalent of the drive-in scene in uh, The Love Bug, for sure. This oh, is yeah. uh, excellent cinema here. <laughs> yeah. So this jousting tournament, it's just a strange LARPing event <laughs> where, where people dress up like medieval fair. But instead of jousting with horses, there's two drivers who drive straight at each other in a game of chicken to see who swerves first. Now, the undefeated champion of the tournament, who's the Red Knight. You mean the Red Knight, which is yes. how they pronounce his name every time. Yeah, he makes quick work of another driver, Sir Lancelot. And as those tires squeal on dirt track, the announcer and the crowd cheer on. Man, yes, this Red Knight, that's one smug. His <laughs> driving <laughs> style is incredible. So, it's like the sm if you could drive smugly, he does. 
So two yeah. things here. He's just always kind of laughing. The, the Red Knight, first of all, for me, was giving off a very John Cleese vibe. And yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. It was it was played by Rob McCary, who played Judge Ren Renletgo from Parks and Rec. Um, yeah. Huh. It's oh yeah. wow! So yeah, I went and dug now, him up and, and read a bit, a little bit about him. But uh, there's a fan theory out there that it was supposed to be Thorndike driving. Well, see, that's I get that. That was exactly what I thought when I saw. It. I said, "This has got to be a tie into Thorndike right here." A doppelganger, yeah. But see, that would be amazing. And then Lancelot, I, I looked him up. That's Hank Jones, who was in the TV movie Ringo, which I never knew there was a TV movie about the drummer Ringo from the Beatles. Oh yeah. And uh, he also was in the Shaggy DA. He played Herbie Hughes in the Mod Squad. He was in the Million Dollar Duck, Barefoot Executive, the Pearl Harbor War Epic, Tora Tora Tora, oh, Blackbeard's yeah. Ghost, uh, and in one final oh. performance before his acclaimed career ended, he was in the Calf from Outer Space. But yeah, but also Ken Berry was nice. also but that's low hanging fruit to throw Ken Berry in the Calf from Outer Space. <laughs> no kidding wow i also love that like all the people who work the fair are kind of like new yorka types who are yeah, like yeah. thuggy new yorker types in medieval clothes and then the audience are all like mod 70s types holding yes. like pre-printed chicken signs yes that and whenever uh you know a joust is over they have the like canned chicken foley from like quirky yeah. or whatever her name is the <laughs> like the old disney like <laughs> it's incredible oh man so good i mean the the smugness of the red knight is will never get old and just gripping yeah. the wheel it's it's so good so after seeing the Red Knight dispatch his opponent, Nicole recognizes Herbie's plan. He gets out of the car, but Willoughby isn't so lucky. Herbie traps him and drives out onto the track to take on the Red Knight. <laughs> the two vehicles race towards each other. Now, wait a second. Before then... they do, Robert, did you notice there was a ceremonial throwing of the hanky no, by the uh, lady fair? I missed that. Yeah. It's... <laughs> I thought about no. you. <laughs> So, yeah, the two vehicles begin racing towards each other, and the Red Knight loses his nerve and swerves his car at the last second, making Herbie and Willoughby the tournament champions. And this makes the, the chicken the chicken run queen, as she's that's the uh, role she is given on IMDb. Uh, she comes running out and <laughs> congratulates them. Bizarre. And while kissing Willoughby, another judge separates them, uh, played by the actor uh, and comedian, an old comedian, Alan Carney. He's a... Uh, to, uh, what's the, what was it? What's the mountains? The Catskills? Yeah, oh, yeah. Those old Catskills yeah. uh, comedians. And he says to him, You want the bread, man? $3. <laughs> Which I, I love that line. That was uh, great. And she went, My brave champion, you have won me. <laughs> she had it like a really <laughs> a, a real thick kingdom. accent, though. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, that would have been a good line for our uh, the trailer that we did. Uh, that's right. <laughs> Well, after all the craziness, Nicole rejoins Herbie and Willoughby, and he apologizes for not believing her and offers to take her to lunch, which she accepts. Well, down at Fisherman's Wharf, the two are about to share what looks like a lobster meal <laughs> as Nicole lunch. Hot day. explains all the reasons why she can't stand Alonzo Hawk to Willoughby's disbelief. And when he reveals to her that Hawk is his uncle, she smacks him with a lobster sending him flying out of the restaurant and into the bay water deadly lobster man it also has a, <laughs> another fo that that classic foley we saw so much in the love bug with the yes, the yes. <laughs> yeah <laughs> she's a violent lady she is she's tough rage issues yeah. well later that evening back at the firehouse in mrs steinmetz's bedroom nicole has brought mrs steinmetz some warm milk and then she calls her grandma yeah, Which, it's weird. Did I miss something? Because she doesn't introduce her as her granddaughter earlier in the film, and now she calls her grandma. I think it's oh, just okay. honorary. Yeah. I thought that was weird, too, because she gives a story. Like, she got to know her because she was living in a building nearby that Hawk knocked down. Right. And that's how she got to know her, just as a nice old lady. So I thought that was weird. Yeah, I kind mm, of interpreted okay. it as honorary kind of grandma figure. Okay. 
Well, anyways, Nicole confesses to her that she kind of likes Willoughby and she regrets hitting him with a lobster, as you do. The two have a pleasant conversation about him and Nicole says good night and exits the room, but she doesn't exit through a door, <laughs> but rather a fireman's pole. And, and now I'm not, I'm not a doctor. But a fireman's pole in an elderly woman's bedroom close to the door doesn't sound like a good idea. <laughs> I laughed out no loud doctor, when no she, because she doesn't like, they don't like, like call it out. She just kind of does it and goes down the fire pole. And I thought that was so funny. There's a weird, super random. Weird. Uh, the set dresser put a door stop. I noticed just, just, I just, just glanced and I saw the, like one of those door stops to keep the, uh, the door from swinging out over and hitting the fireman pole. And I was just like that. Oh, well, you, know, you, know, you got a <laughs> safety. <laughs> safety first, right? Thought of everything. <laughs> well, Nicole says goodnight to Herbie as well. And who's having a dream flashback about being a famous racing car. And we're, we're treated to a montage of racing scenes racing from the first car. movie. Used to be a famous racing yeah. car. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of padding yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. Because there's absolutely no close-up shots of any of the main actors from the previous film. It's all from a distance, which is it was just very strange. Getting their money's worth out of that footage. So, cut to the next morning. Willoughby is applying makeup to his black eye due to the lobster being slapped across his face, and he's rehearsing his speech that he's going to give his uncle Alonzo, calling him out for the evil person that he really is. Before going to see Hawk, Willoughby drops by to see Mrs. Steinmetz, but catches a glimpse of Nicole as she leaves for work, and he hides underneath Herbie. And it's, uh, I thought it was a good thing that Herbie didn't choose that moment to roll backwards on his own. Yeah. Uh, so she was, he uh, was uh, doing a little peep in there. He was. It's a little <laughs> uncomfortable. A little peeping on them gams. So after Nicole drives away, Mrs. Steinmetz is pleased to find Willoughby talking to Herbie, and Willoughby tells her that, He's heading back home to Hawk City, Missouri. <laughs> I want to go to there That's, so bad. Yeah. Uh, before he leaves, he tells Mrs. Steinmetz that he's going to go see his uncle and tell him exactly what he thinks of him. This makes Mrs. Steinmetz very happy, and she knows it would make Nicole feel that way too, and she pleads with him to stick around to tell her himself. But Willoughby politely declines in the two part ways. So meanwhile, back at Alonzo A. Hawk Wrecking and Building Corporation, <laughs> Alonzo Hawk is trying to track down his nephew when he gets another phone call from his builder, Mr. Barnsdorf, who again asks him when he's going to want them to start work on the new building. And can I just say, I want to hang with Barnsdorf. He seems super uh, cool. Yeah. Getting a real, yeah. uh, he's like a sinister Michael Jordan vibe with his sinister cigar. <laughs> he's a cool Placing customer, beds. man. He is, he is. Yeah, and Barnsdorf tells him that it's costing Hawk $80,000 a day for his men to sit around and play cards, which is no light chunk of change. Mm -mm. So while seething about Barnsdorf, Hawk's secretary tells him that she just found out that his nephew has checked out of his hotel, which sends Hawk into a rage. Willoughby arrives to hear his uncle's fit and decides not to confront him face to face after all, but decides to call him from the lobby instead. Smart move. Hawk takes the call and is pleased to hear from him, thinking Willoughby has good news, and says one of one of my favorite lines that Hawk said, which is, that Hawk blood will tell in the end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which is just a great line. I also love in his rant, he says he's a kindly, fun-loving fellow. <laughs> good. A kindly, fun-loving fellow. And Willoughby tells his uncle that he's leaving town by faking that he's on a boat to Helsinki, and also Why? tells him that he should really leaves Mrs. Steinmetz alone. Uh, and that triggers Hawk. Yeah, so he, he says the Helsinki he makes, makes all the noises. Like the dock yeah. noises, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and he does an announcement or something. <laughs> In like a bad, like, Swedish accent. Like, yeah, okay. Yeah. This is a, a a theme where he is really good at throwing his voice on the phone. Oh, this is not the last time we'll see it. <laughs> True. Ah, uh, Okay. So yeah, after he tells him that he's heading towards Helsinki, that, that triggers Hawk, and Hawk starts screaming loudly, which busts the glass in the telephone booth that Willoughby is calling from. <laughs> uh, Willoughby, <laughs> Willoughby gently drops the phone and walks away as some people who just happen to be standing around nearby and who are clearly from the 70s look on in amazement. And this concludes Act One. He used to be a famous racing car. 
Used to be a famous racing car. Used to be a famous racing car. So the hawk has blown a gasket and is on the couch stewing as his lawyers look on. He's decided to take matters into his own hands and harass Steinmetz and steal Herbie. Hawk hops in his Rolls Royce, but declares that he was a repo man at the age of 19 and was the best repo man this side of the Mississippi. His nickname was Hot Wire Hawk. <laughs> <laughs> His briefcase contains a pair of pliers, a screwdriver, and a piece of wire, a.k.a. a coat hanger. I like he kept the briefcase. Yes. He's got yeah, like a just, kit. It's good. Yeah. So he proceeds to pull the lock on Herbie with the coat hanger and then hot wires Herbie from the rear. I mean, I would have thought he would have done it from the ignition switch, um, but I don't know a lot about uh Hot wiring cars, but hot wire Robert was not my name. But uh, <laughs> Hawk insults Herbie, calling him a one cylinder hair dryer. To which Herbie decides to lock up and not move, causing a traffic jam, getting the attention of the cops. Hawk proceeds to insult the cops, and Herbie plays tug of war with a police cruiser who is trying to tow him out of the road. There was a great scene when he locks up of all the cars getting hit sequentially. <laughs> really yeah. Tricks. And everybody's like, arr, arr, arr. Uh, Hawk is a little uh, hair trigger in this. Well, this again, area. this yeah. is, this is where, uh, you know, him bristling against uh, governmental control kind of seemed oddly relevant. <laughs> true. True. The rope snaps, and we get the same gag we got in Absent Minded Professor, where the cop cars collide and the bumpers jettison upwards, creating sort of a uh, triangle. Yeah, classic yeah. gag. Also, I love his line where uh, the traffic commissioner shows up and he says, What are you doing in that monkey suit? <laughs> it's just like in a uniform. <laughs> it's his dress uniform. I love that. Uh, one. Also, the uh, the the police radio when the cars are, uh, <laughs> are wrecked. See the man. See the man. Which we would say. <laughs> we would say that. And the, not understanding. <laughs> yes. Still not understanding. Herbie flees the scene and drives up to Hawk's office and tosses him out in front of the waiting lawyers. How did he do that? I guess he just made a hard right turn and opened oh, yeah, his door open so, yeah. and Hawk went flying out. That's right. At the airport, Nicole is heading to work, and Willoughby is in a very impressive disguise with long beard, trench coat, and hat, <laughs> looking a lot like Doug Clifford from Credence Clearwater Revival. <laughs> <laughs> Nicole sees through the disguise and hears Willoughby trashing Alonzo and is quite smitten now by his new backbone he's showing. Back at the firehouse, Herbie and Miss Steinmetz head to the market. She decides to work on her shopping list while Herbie drives around town. Suddenly, a trio of Lincoln Continental Mark IVs pursue Herbie. Herbie escapes by driving up a dirt embankment. The Continentals give chase, and Herbie goes up a parking deck. And I beg the question that it looks like the Lincolns barely fit through that parking deck. I wonder yeah. how they shot that even if they over That's over cranked space. it to make it go faster i'm still amazed <laughs> that those cars were fitting through there because it was real narrow they had like and a hundred of them yeah they just went through <laughs> and didn't hawk give that he, he gives a great line doesn't he say something like uh, get that car dead or alive <laughs> yeah <laughs> i also love that she's going to Vern's market <laughs> which i don't know why that's funny to me but it is so like weirdly specific like we're going to Vern's market 
Yeah. And, I, and she doesn't seem phased by it at all. Oh. She's like, oh, Herbie, you knocked my glasses off. Completely unfazed. We got some great George Bruns music here. It's like straight out of Robin Hood. Uh, really good mm -hmm. stuff. At the top of the deck, Herbie jumps over two Volkswagen bugs and over uh. to the next parking deck. So real quick here, let's, let's check in with Mr. Andy Brown. Uh, how's this movie doing on the silly meter right now, Andy? Oh, it's off the charts. <laughs> it was very Bondy, Bond-ish with the uh, jumping from a parking lot, parking deck. Grandma is frustrated with Herbie, who, as Andy pointed out, knocked her glasses off. And she's oblivious to the goings-on around her. Herbie ducks into a into the Sharon Palace Hotel, where he drives to the dining room. Oh, Herbie man. darts into the kitchen, and we get the good old fashioned cake gag as a waiter turns around and creams Hawks lawyers with a great foley effect. Once again, just the <laughs> the uh, Mater D here, <laughs> who gets in one line and barely even gets his profile on camera. Uh, Fritz failed again. Again, the mouth popping guy. Oh, I didn't mm. notice that. Um, That's right. yeah. yeah, that was. I saw him in the credits, and I had to look for him because I didn't notice him. He's like barely in the scene, but they brought him in just for that. So we'll be seeing him again in a couple of movies. So don't worry. <laughs> yeah. Okay, buckle up, folks, because back at Hawk's office, his administrative assistant sees Herbie off in the distance. We cut to Herbie riding up uh. the guy wires of the Golden Gate Bridge, the same bridge. Herbie tried to off himself on in the previous movie. It's a real uh, 180 for Herbie. It's yeah, like jumping off the building. I for some reason I could like let go, but then when this happened, I was like, oh my! This Lord. was now we. This was ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, even for this movie, it it's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, especially the guys. Like if he was like trying to get away from something, and it was like a desperate escape. Okay, but. Him doing it, and the guy's chasing him on foot That's up so the ridiculous. thing, like view to a kill. It's ridiculous. Oh, <laughs> no. So no. As, as Herbie drives up the wires, the lawyers are giving chase, and I ask the question, do you suppose this are, these are billable hours for the lawyers, or do they give special ledger <laughs> for uh, risking their own lives chasing cars around town? It better be, because let me tell you, it is windy on that bridge, and that would blow you right <laughs> off. You would be dead. Oh, it makes me nervous just to think about. Not funny, man. Grandma is still oblivious as Herbie chases the lawyers back down the bridge wire. What's up with every time they, they see an old lady in a movie, they have to play harpsichord music? Yes, <laughs> <that>? yes. <laughs> it's like, why? <laughs> It's so true. Now I want to make a movie just to do that. Oh, I just want a compilation, <laughs> like a YouTube compilation, old lady harpsichord thing. We've got to do that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Back at the firehouse, Herbie and Grandma return to see that Willoughby and Nicole are together, and Willoughby has decided to fight his uncle. Taking Grandma's advice, Herbie takes Nicole and Willoughby to the beach while Hawk chauffeur follows great chauffeur he's so good mm -hmm. peak chauffeur nicole and willoughby talk on the beach while herbie chases seagulls in the sand <laughs> which is, <laughs> is pretty comical i, yeah. I actually laugh pretty pretty good at that as they leave the beach the road is blocked after hawk's chauffeur pays off a local fisherman to park his rv or whatever that is in the middle of the road i love that it's like a typical like like new hampshire fisherman right <laughs> it's like ah, yes speak your mind whatever to, can't get there from here yeah does that stop herbie no oh, man no. what do you think there andy do you think that's gonna stop herbie <sighs> i thought it was is but... herbie gonna wait for the tow truck no. i gotta say nope. this no. is uh coming up this is one of my favorite scenes in the movie <laughs> herbie's a herbie jumps into the ocean <laughs> off a dock and floats up the beach as sharks approach. Well, what, wait, what a shot though. Him going into the ocean. It's like yeah. they just threw they this that? Volkswagen just into the water. <laughs> <laughs> it makes me laugh every time I see it. It's just like launched into the water and just like submerges. Great. 
like and how many cut. takes they did of that. Great. <laughs> <laughs> we got it. Check the All gate. right, back to one. Let's yeah. do it again. Yeah, I was about to say that's a one take shot right there. I also love when they're underwater after that. There's like the wah wah theme, the wah wah oh, guitar yeah. uh-huh, uh-huh. to to convey underwaterness. And what is a <laughs> shark gonna do to a car? By the way, right. so that's uh, I, I I thought that out loud to myself. Why is a shark chasing a car? And then <laughs> Nicole asked that very question. Why would a shark be following a Volkswagen? <laughs> Oh man, I'm curious. Yeah, this was uh, curious before Jaws creatures. too, so they they uh, got ahead of the curve on that one. Mm. Herbie catches a wave as Willoughby <laughs> asks a passing surfer dude <laughs> how to get to San Francisco. Oh, okay, Andy, how about now? Oh, God. What's the silly mirror looking like for you now? Oh God, oh God, <laughs> blue screen surfing is <laughs> always good. That is so. <laughs> I mean. Whoa! <laughs> Splash! <laughs> again, again, Disney's obsession with anything vaguely countercultural. Yes, like the cartoonish surfer guy, like ooh, oh, maybe I've had too hey, much. Man, man, what's man. Up, dude? <laughs> Whoa! Back at the firehouse, Nicole and Willoughby arrive to find the firehouse empty and Grandma sitting in an empty building. It's intense, man. All her stuff is gone. It's dark. How's that legal? It's dark. illegal. That yeah. you can't do that. Call the exactly. police. No. She operates outside of norms. Yeah, like. She operates outside. <laughs> she of the works law. outside of the law. It's true. <laughs> She's like the A team. She can't go to the police. <laughs> <laughs> they'll know she could have called them they would have helped surely the captain has some sort of pool that she was married to right yeah right she could you call the boys so. down yeah. at the, the precinct uh, the fire my department. husband was a hero of the great fire at hawk van and storage <laughs> hawk's got a pretty pretty deep uh, portfolio here he does he's he's he wets his beak in a lot of uh, well, he, different he, uh, he had the storage place in medfield too he did yeah yeah wow. let me ask you guys a question so herbie was a famous race car do you think hawk knows that herbie was like famous or do you think he's just he doesn't recognize him at all yeah, he's too he he's too busy with his dealings to uh yeah. take in the news you know he's he hmm. only watch he only races the ponies <laughs> <laughs> So at Hawk Van and Storage, Herbie takes matters into his own hands or wheels and smashes through the door. They're greeted with a recording of Hawk telling them to halt. It cracks me up. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, that's so good. <laughs> Classic Hawk there. That's that's yeah. Hawk Security Sur- uh, Service, another enterprise, uh, shows up right as they locate their things stored on old number twenty two. Man, that's kind of great uh, security cars. They're like pukey yellow and red, old mm, giant yes. boats. Great. While Grandma stalls, Herbie sneaks off and dumps a bunch of furniture on top of the cops to cut <laughs> off Grandma and her gang. Herbie's trashing other people's stuff, man. Yeah, they, well, yeah. Herbie gets somebody, from... somebody else's old 97 or whatever it is. They don't yeah. care. <laughs> Herbie don't care. Uh, you know, there's some interesting, like, Herbie miniature shots going up these yes, levels. Yes, I caught yeah. that. Yeah, I agree. Yes, like, like scaled crazy. down models, yeah. yeah. like there is a pretty crappy miniature, if you ask me. I thought it was not very <laughs> it was well pretty done. pretty obvious, yeah. <laughs> I liked it, because I just wanted one. I want a miniature Herbie. <laughs> yeah. They escape on old number 22 through the streets of San Francisco. Oh, boy. Here we go, ding, folks. Ding. A drunk cowboy or businessman sleeping one off on the streets. <laughs> Here's the commotion. Yeah, this is great. <laughs> and decides to hitch a ride. Grandma politely ignores the gentleman as he as she knits. So you've got the uh, double vision, too, going into a single vision when he spots the uh, trolley. Always good. <laughs> yeah. Yes. He's had too much sheep dip sheep dip and they sheep call liquor dip. in this town that's what he said sheep dip. All right, i need to adopt that one that's a good yeah. one Ooh, too much sheep dip i was doing fine until i got into that sheep dip that's what you say robert yeah you know that the the drunk cowboy that actor he played 
uh, in uh, what was the movie? I recognize I, him. I recognize him for something too. I didn't. He's I didn't in a lot of Western Western stuff. For sure. Turner and Hooch. He is the old oh. guy that gets killed. That's Turner's oh, friend. Oh yes, yes. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's who it was. Yeah. Anyways, Hawk sporting a pretty dope smoking jacket. Oh yes, I want that jacket. Has declared victory and ensures his crew they can start digging tomorrow. He then is informed that they got their things out of the storage building and are on the run again. As they get to the crest of the hill with Herbie pushing old number 22, Hawk and his security team arrive and Herbie takes off through the streets of San Francisco, <laughs> crashing Hawk's goons into a pretzel stand. Yeah, I love why a pretzel <laughs> stand. That's so weird. Why not? Also, my question was, where is everyone else in San Francisco? Because there's a shot of like Hawk and like 20 guys all coming down the street. And like it's them and the streetcar and no one else. Everybody's like cleared the streets for them. I always, as a kid, I thought that shot was so ominous, though. It's like yeah. such a, a far shot. And then they like zoom in on all the cars. It's like, huh. Yeah, it's spooky. Number 22 starts to roll down the other side of the hill while Grandma and the Rancher chat. As things get very awkward oh, between man. the two, Herbie and company chase after them, but not before they interrupt a stuffy party <laughs> with a cellist <laughs> performs. It's a great gag. Does, yeah, yeah. Because why not? Going through stuffy backyard events never gets old. That's right. I mean, any movie yeah. that does that, it's good times. The old man at that stuffy party event, do you guys, anybody recognize oh, him? Yeah. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, that's Judd Fletcher from uh, Andy Griffith's show. Played by the actor Bert, uh, was it Bert Merchant, Merston, something like that? Oh, I didn't even know his real yeah. name, but yeah, he's like instantly recognizable. And we got that uh, band organ going nuts in the uh, in yeah. the old twenty two, <laughs> yeah. cranking away the whole yeah. time. Yeah. As number twenty two heads for the bay, Herbie pulls up next to them. As Willoughby jumps off Herbie onto the streetcar, applying the brake just in time. Nice shot of the uh, the sparks flying off of it when it's breaking, and uh, and it kind of almost goes into the bay. Again, the oblivious gag was played as Grandma and the rancher have no idea what just transpired. Got to get Jeff Bridges to play him in the reboot. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she is so weird throughout this whole scene because she's knitting, and like kind of engaging with him, but mostly not. And mostly kind of like ignoring him. It's really yeah. weird. And she played it kind of strange there. Cause she's kind of like smirks and sort of, Oh, interesting. Great. Shut up. You know, kind of, I really don't care. But then she starts like really getting into it and he's like grabbing her thigh and it's, yeah. it's awkward. Yeah. Like I was watching it going, this is getting weird. But <laughs> And, and then in the background is the painting of her late husband. <laughs> right. <laughs> you, know? you take that with you everywhere. I <laughs> mean, great. The painting had like yeah. eyes that were just like bugging out. looking <laughs> at the Yeah. Why not at this point? And I mean, then they <laughs> close when it's getting close to the, the I mean, bay going into the that's bay. Right. There, yeah. like, <laughs> the old cruise Jeff. Bye bye birdie gag. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The next morning, Grandma decides she's going to take matters into her own hands. And after Nicole heads to work, she hops in Herbie, takes off to settle the score with Hawk. And that wraps up act number two. So you think it's been silly so far. You are not ready. <laughs> Let us finish this thing. We cut to Hawk's office as he's getting a back massage by his assistant, who of course is named Millicent, which I thought was the perfect name for her. 
so good. Millicent has like a weird Bond girl vibe for me. Yes, yes, totally. There's something there's something creepy going on between them. Well, I'd say so. I'd, she yeah. she uh definitely, you know, goes all in on the evil vibe, you know. Yeah. We have a whole new set of lawyers now too. He's canned the uh, the last group of lawyers and hired a whole new group now. That's right. They come in and they say that he can't tear down the Steinmetz house as he doesn't have the necessary permits or own the land, which is probably more important. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he kicks them out. He says all his lawyers let him down. Does Robert, what does this remind you of anything? Anything? No, okay. Nothing at all. I, just, <laughs> I, I find no connection at all. Me to neither. Everyday life. <laughs> um, but not to worry. He says he's like a finely tuned violin. He says all he needs is some peace and quiet. And uh, just as he says that, a window cleaner interrupts his reverie. So we got the window washer. He's on a big old gurney kind of going around. And it's one of those guys. It's like in every one of these movies. It is one of those guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, and, you know, Hawk is doing his thing. And so Miss Steinmetz sees the platform for the washer. And so, naturally, when it comes down, she drives Herbie onto the platform, takes it up to the 23rd floor, just like that. Pretty easy. God, this gave me the wheelies just watching this. Yeah, him hanging from it, like, free, like legit made me uneasy. Him jumping on the platform as it's going up, that, that was, uh, I mean, they timed that perfectly. Yeah, so Willoughby sees her going onto the platform, jumps onto the platform. Oh. yelling for help she can't hear him because she's listening to some soothing music <laughs> eventually she hears and she says she'll let the platform down only if willoughby will promise to let her in what? to see hawk yes. like what in the world is wrong with this lady she is a stone cold killer man yes she is she yeah she's got a all she cares about is getting hawk so what if people die i mean this dude is hanging <laughs> the ends justify the means <laughs> hanging yeah, by his I, bare I, hands I, like 20 stories above the ground it's insane insane i'll pull you up only if you let me go get hawk i, I will point out as a kid i was mesmerized by this window washing machine when it's in operation oh, the, absolutely the foam and the mechanized washers and everything is pretty good also i will say point of order hawk's office wouldn't have windows that open i mean come on that's that's, that's, that's perilous true. but i mean we're suspended at this point plot plot hole here yeah, in the meantime hawk has called a rogue wrecker to wreck the firehouse without a permit now this guy is perfectly cast yes and he has an incredible unbelievable connection to disney this is because i had seen i didn't recognize him visually uh, but i saw his name in the credits and looked up who it was this is chuck mccann who oh. was a character actor and voiceover actor who was everywhere, but he was the voice of Dreamfinder in Journey to Imagination. Right. At that is wild. Really playing against type here. Yes. <laughs> you wouldn't believe it was Completely the same different. guy. He also did the voices of a bunch of the Beagle Boys for DuckTales, much more in style <laughs> than this. And didn't he do Launchpad as well? Uh, right? I'm not sure about that, maybe. I think so. Uh, he is just great in this. He's kind of got like the flatly cut long hair. Yeah, he's got that real 70s look. I don't even know what you call that look. but So Hawk is boasting about getting somebody to wreck down the firehouse. This time, Steinmetz and Willoughby pull up and over here. Well, Miss Steinmetz hears this and she gets angry, hits the soap for the window washer directly into Hawk's office. As Michael mentioned, the windows are wide open. That would be breezy, oh. I think. I also love that the thing is, it's very it's a very Batman gag with the window cleaning thing being labeled Alonzo Hawk window clean system. <laughs> yes, with a K. Yeah, window, window clean with a K, yeah. So this leads to absolute mayhem, as you would assume, uh, Herbie chasing around Hawk in a sea of soap in this giant, giant office with wacky George Bruns music. Again, a la Robin Hood. Wacky sound effects. Oh. Statues dropping. <sighs> I Mr. wish Steinmet. there was like film <laughs> of the recording <laughs> sessions for the Alonzo Hawk like ADR sound effects. Yes. Oh, oh, Jeff, oh, oh. Yes. 
boogity, boogity adjacent. Yo, very boogity That's adjacent. Right. Yeah. Right up that tree for sure. Oh man. So Mrs. Steinmetz is reasoning with Herbie. Eventually Hawk floats out the floor and runs down the hall. I love the scene of the doors opening and him just like floating on it's a thing. It's so of good. Balls. Yeah. <laughs> And for some reason, he decides to leave the building for a ledge running around the building. Well, it seems like a natural first uh, stop. This movie, I do not like heights, and this movie is uh, un- unfavorable oh, they, to that. They play with that I'm a lot. right there with you, Michael. I'm telling you, it gave me the Yeah, I, mean, it's, uh, I, I don't have a major issue with heights, but yeah, this made me a little queasy for some reason watching that. You know, especially when he got to the edge and was about to fall over. Oh, yeah. My- and just watching the car driving around. I mean, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, there's no stopping Herbie. He chases him out on the ledge. Situation is getting out of control until Mrs. Steinmetz pushes the only button she knows to stop Herbie, which is to threaten to send him to a used car lot again. Killer. Stone cold killer, Miss Steinmetz. Well, and uh, Wilby has yeah, to, like, man. talk her into keeping him from killing Mr. Hawk. Like, right. he has to, like, lean on her to, she's finally like, oh, all right. <laughs> And then, uh, you know, she's just all of a sudden back to her kind of vegetative state, just saying, oh, it's just a great morning, <laughs> calmly <laughs> heading home to get in touch with the uh, Lutz Garden, the rogue wrecker, who is, that's just, again, the name, the casting, all of it, Lutz Garden. <laughs> so back at the firehouse, Willoughby calls Lutz Garden as Hawk, again, throwing his voice. So dumb. Tells him that wrecking the firehouse is off, but could he please change the address and wreck another house instead, which is actually Hawk's address. <laughs> which is <laughs> crazy. It's, it seems like it would be easy to figure out, but you know, you got to wreck when you wreck in the middle of the night because you're kind of clandestine. Uh, you never know take your equipment in the middle of the night to this fancy (laughs) neighborhood wake everybody up and knock down this fancy house another excellent scene here hawk can't sleep (laughs) he calls his doctor who encourages him to count sheep liam dunn yeah liam dunn yeah mr hilltop yeah reverend reverend johnson from blazing saddles (laughs) young and he also was dr morgan and gus oh wow there you go or if he was Dr. Morgan here. I wonder if, it was this, if he was playing the same character. So uh, we've had some ridiculous scenes to this point. But I really think this Alonzo Hawk dream sequence <laughs> takes the cake for oh the whole movie. Oh my gosh. It is terrifying. It is wild. Um, so first, there are indeed sheep. But they begin to have the number 53 on them. They eventually turn into Herbies with mouths and teeth. Why? <laughs> Ugh. Ugh. Horrifying. Angry eyes. There's also Angry like eyes. the you know the filter on the camera that's kind of the dreamy cloudy filter. So it's all like really dark and cloudy and yeah, the angry eyed Herbies with mouths and teeth. And and there's dogs crying. Yes, like the dogs whining. Like, like, yes. Whining hounds out on the moors. It's very unsettling. <laughs> Then, in a very unfortunate turn, they turn into American Indians with Hulk tied to a stake. The sound of beating drums. They have headdresses on and tomahawks. They proceed to throw the tomahawks and scalp Hulk. But they do it half. First, they take yes. the front half or the left half, then they take the right half. But how? What was the filming like of this? To have, because they're the Herbie, the Indian Herbies <laughs> are like standing on two feet and like yeah. dance, like there are like six they of must them. Must have been dancing. using those mini- miniatures again. I would, yeah, think. those miniatures. Yeah, 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 but still, they have still. like a big marionette rig of like Indian Herbies <laughs> dancing. <laughs> Crazy. Oh, and last but not least, we have Hawk on the top of the Empire State Building <laughs> swatting away Herbies. Yeah. <laughs> and the, the Herbie sound effect going. <laughs> At they got to get in that oil spray. They held it onto it this oh, long. Yeah. They get it in there. Yep. That was a fixture in Herbie, uh, the love bug. But man, here it is again. So 
Oh, oh man. My gosh. That is rough. I had forgotten um, about the Indian Herbies and the King Kong Herbies. Me I too. Had completely me forgotten too. about that. Hawk wakes up to a phone call from Lutz Garden who asks him if he's sure that this address is the right one for the demolition. Gives Hawk the address. Hawk says, sure, I know as well as my, that as well as my own address. Yoinks, it is his address. And you see the wrecking ball (laughs) slam into Hawk's house and Hawk slides down into the yard in his pajamas and proceeds to chase Lutz Garden down the street into the horizon. (laughs) Really felt like he was going to drop some swears here. Like yeah, was... <laughs> he was pushing his buttons hard. <laughs> yeah, if only it had made it to the 80s. It would have had the swears in it. Uh, the next day, newspapers announce that Hawk has surrendered. He places a call to Miss, Mrs. Steinmetz. Says he admires her spunk. <laughs> but he realizes because his house got wrecked last night, he can't go around tearing down all the old buildings in San Francisco. Uh, he seems a changed man with a gentle tone, guys. Mm. The, uh, the uh, underlying theme of San Francisco preservation runs through yeah, this movie. <laughs> There's a lot of uh, San Francisco plot lines, yeah. Uh, later, Willoughby and Nicole are back at the restaurant. They are waiting for Mrs. Steinmetz, and she is not coming. Turns out she is at the firehouse. Oh, sorry. I missed one thing. After he hangs up, his lawyers praise him for doing the right thing. Hawk says, it's an old gag. We're still going for the grandmother, right for the jugular. And then grabs (laughs) the guy's neck. That's right. (laughs) Right for the jugular, baby. Right for the jugular. Then he had another line before that. It was like, um, what are you talking about, fathead? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So later, Willoughby and Nicole are back at the restaurant. They are waiting for Miss Steinmetz, and she is not coming. Turns out she is at the firehouse having a date with Judson from the trolley. I couldn't believe this. How how did she set that up? How did she find him? And why? Yeah. I'll find that nice drunk old man. (laughs) Right. Oh, well, Hawk is back at it, and we see some heavy machinery at work around the firehouse, shaking it to its very foundation. Even the portrait of the captain falls. And boy, Mrs. Steinmetz, we, we finally see some emotion from her. She begins to weep. Yeah. Finally broke her. That's right. They go outside, see a crew of bulldozers and wreckers led by Mr. Hawk. Herbie heads out for help. <laughs> Mr. Hawk's chauffeur driving the Willie's Jeep. <laughs> yeah, they've got like, the, <laughs> the Jeep out front. Oh, it's great. And he's wearing like the coveralls. He's wearing like the uh, Thorndike coveralls, but they have the H. And They've stuff got that. Too. I love that That's H right, logo. Yeah. I want something with that H logo on it. Uh, and a reminder this is all completely illegal. All right. Right. <laughs> well, you know, you can't rebuild the old firehouse once it's gone. Once it's gone. Better to ask forgiveness than ask permission. That's right. That's right. So Hawk gives them 10 minutes to leave, which cracks me up because it's like, well, I mean, just leave now or give them like an hour. Ten minutes isn't going to make any difference. Uh, laughingly, Judson says, she's under my personal protection. <laughs> That's probably not going to work. Back at the restaurant, Willoughby is struggling to express his affection. And man, the Willoughby like monologues <laughs> are getting really worn thin at this point. I'll tell you what. What's it like? This one's like about a relative or something that went over Niagara Falls. Falls in a yes. barrel. <laughs> and uh, they never heard from him again. But the why would you even tell the Whitfields us? are not? They are like rabbits, but then they seek adventure. Gosh! <laughs> Luckily, Herbie shows up honking, so they must get in Herbie and see what's happening. Uh, Herbie on the way out honks at uh, another beetle. They follow in suit, and we get a montage of a lot of beetles following Herbie. Let me tell you, I didn't like as this. a kid. I thought the army of Herbies was awesome. Like, I thought that was so cool. It was like Helm's Deep in uh, Lord of the Rings. <laughs> like, the army showing up. It was so awesome. <laughs> Look to the east. Yeah. Oh. I come back you to you the, now uh, at the yeah. turning of the tide. You've got all kinds of beetles following. you got the little junkyard yellow beetle that can barely run. Love that guy. And, mo- and the best is <laughs> like, you have a, a painted up beetle with a couple necking in the back at a drive-in movie. <laughs> 
and they are like a still shot of them with like the blue screen going on yes. behind it's such a weird choice it's really, the yeah, freeze it's frame make out people at the drive-in so good and throughout this whole thing it keeps cutting back to them just being freeze framed i guess if you're going <laughs> yeah. to need a uh army of vw san francisco is the place to go for it oh for sure they should have thrown in some uh some buses as well, some VW buses. That would have been a good idea. Yeah, I didn't like this though. I I thought this this gag cheapens Herbie because oh. I think uh. Herbie is is unique and uh. that's what makes him unique is because he's you know self aware and but so by having a bunch of them, I just like I said, I just I found it cheapened. I you know what I th- I thought as I was watching it this time, I th- I thought the same thing and thought like if I was watch as a kid, I thought it was amazing. But like watching mm. it today, I I kind of agree, I agree with you, especially considering like in the previous movie, like other cars were just cars. Otherwise, then Herbie was like a murderer because he did kill that other car. <laughs> right. So if it was like a person car, then that is really rough. If it's oh, just a car yeah. car, who cares? You know. So uh, yeah, I I kind of agree with you on that one. Back at the firehouse, we're down to one minute. They, did you notice every time they cut to the fire, the firehouse, they they sound the foghorn off of the distance. I did not notice that. Yeah, I mean, it, almost, I think they did it three times. Like every time they cut, <laughs> right, so they cut to the scene of the fire. Maybe it was Willoughby. <laughs> so we're down to one minute, and Judson and Steinmetz have decided to stand pat. The captain would like that. Uh, Judson kind of sacrilegiously dons the captain's old fire hat. I would say. She pro, she pro offers it. Okay, yeah. okay. Uh, he proceeds to shoot someone on a bulldozer with a fire hose, which I loved, <laughs> and uh, proceeds to make his way through the construction crew until a bubble in the hose bursts and destroys the hose. Not to worry, the cavalry of the Beatles has arrived, and here they come by the score, chasing off the construction crew. Finally, they pin in Alonzo, who a hawk, who gets caught and eventually flipped by a bulldozer, who he talks back to. I uh, I wondered why all the guys in like the heavy machinery were afraid of the Volkswagens. That's a good. good why question. are you afraid of them? Maybe it's because did you hear that as they were coming, like in the big herd, they added like tiger sound fully, like yes, that Disney yes. cat. Wow! 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 <laughs> For some reason. And then now they're chasing Hawk through a vacant lot. Herbie won't stop until Willoughby says he won't be able to come to the wedding, which gets him to stop. Wedding? Mm -hmm. Hawk runs into a police car and runs it off the road, leading him to get arrested. And we cut to Willoughby and Nicole's wedding. Like we said, it happens fast. Uh, which is attended by a bunch of other Beatles who form a tunnel to drive out of the fire station through. Which was the shot they always used in promos. I hope theirs worked out better than Jim and Carol's, I guess. I hope. Yeah. Well, we'll never know because they never talk about it again. <laughs> uh, but that is Herbie Rides Again. <laughs> So I, I, I've this movie for me. Al- Alonzo Hawk makes this movie. For oh me. yeah, and yeah, no doubt. And so I I had to go and look up Keenan Wynn. And did you guys know that he was Chester Copperpot in Goonies? The picture that they show of Chester Copperpot, the old man. Oh, no. that's Keenan oh, Wynn. Oh, weird. What? Uncredited, but yeah. Where'd you that find that? I am DB, my man. That's a great name for that. Is a good Keenan Wynn character name, yeah. Yeah, it's it's just the picture of me has the beard and everything, but yeah, that was Keenan Wynn. Weird, yeah. Let's uh, let's rate this, I guess. If we must, we must, yeah. What are we uh, what's our scale, Robert? Our scale tonight is a uh. A theme, a, a, a tool, a instrument used throughout this movie, and we're going to go with wrecking balls. Ah, that's very apropos. 
So, out of five wrecking balls, Robert, what do you give the plot and writing of Herbie Rides Again? Um, I'm going to have to go with a two on this one. It, it yeah, there's not a lot, uh, a lot going on as far as the, the plot and the writings. It's, they're just they're hanging on to Herbie, and uh, this it's just gag city. So two for me. Okay, Andy. I think it's barely a two. It really needs to be closer to one, but I'm going to give it a two, two wrecking balls. Uh, Michael? It's hard for me because of the Hawk stuff. I want to give it higher because, like, obviously for, like, 30 years I've remembered every Hawk line. So it's hard to, like, diss that. Um, yeah. Whew, I'll, I'll give it a three. It's a low <laughs> three, but it, uh, it's the Hawk bump. I think I'll go back down to two. You know, when it started, I was like, well, this is kind of clever way of getting out of just having another racing movie. Like you have a heavy guy who's Herbie's trying to stop. And then, uh, you know, as it unwinded I, and, uh, you know, I realized I was nostalgic for most of it. I was like, I can't, I can't believe that this goes on the way it goes on. Um, yeah. yeah it could have been an interesting movie, I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But well, you know what would have been really interesting is to stick with the original characters, and you know that's true. Yeah, that that's true. Should, that that's, that's really true. brings it down for me. I was like, well, this is just dumb. I said, it just feels like a filler. I just don't understand. Well, let's move on to uh, casting and acting, and we will go back to you, Andy. What do you? How many wrecking balls do you give that? <sighs> I want based off of Hulk alone. It, I want to give it a five. But I'm going to go back. I mean, I don't think it was bad, poorly cast. I thought the cast was pretty good. So I'm going to give it a four for the so three for the everybody else. And then Hawk knocks up to a five. So I'm going to stick with a four, um, store, four wrecking balls. Okay, we'll go to Michael next. You know, I had to overcome the fact that, like, in my youth, I always viewed Kim Barry as the inferior replacement for someone cooler. Like, in my mind, that's just who he was because of Andy Griffith and then this. Um, but, but, but I mean, he does what he's like. I mean, he is that character that he is supposed to play. And I'll go along with Andy. I mean, the Hulk will push me up to a four for that. I, I'm going to agree with that. And because you got Helen Hayes in there who, you know, <laughs> her character was insane, but... Uh, her acting, I thought, was really interesting. And, you know, she is a legend. She so. is, like, not a Disney legend, but a legend, legend, legend. A real legend. So, uh, Hawk and her get up to a four for me. Robert? Uh, casting and acting. I, I'm going to go... I'm going to go with a... I'm going to go with a three. Uh, simply mm. because of Hawk. Um, uh I think he he carries the, carries the entire movie absolutely uh, for me. So and that's going to bump it up to a three off of a two. All right, and we'll stick with you, Robert, with production value. How many wrecking balls are you giving this one? It's it's okay. I mean, I think some of the 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 green screen stuff was bad. Some of the miniature stuff was bad. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stick with a three on the production value. I think the miniature stuff kind of kills it for me. Okay, Michael? Yeah, I'll give it a three, too. It definitely doesn't have the scope of the first one, for sure. I will stick with the three as well. I think, uh, you know, got to give Hawk's uh, office some credit. Cause true, that's true. Glorious, but everything else, yeah, I agree. Well, it's been said, and Andy? I, I'm going to go a little less than you guys. I'm going to go with the two. I thought they did a pretty crappy job with most of it, uh, <laughs> especially compared to what they could, what they did in the first film. So yeah, yeah, I could see that for sure. All right. We will stay with you, Andy, for entertainment value. How many wrecking balls are you giving this one? This was a dumb movie. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Herbie was really wasted. I don't know. This is a, I'm going to give it a, a two. I mean, there was, and I think I want to give it, it could have been a one, but Hawk is just so, I don't know. I think Hawk may bump it up to a three for me, but I'm going to stick with a two, two, two wrecking balls because just Hawk's just so, so good. And that's yes. just what I enjoyed. Really great. Uh, Robert, what do you give it? I'm going to, uh, I'm going to go with Andy on this one. It's, it's a two. It, uh, I'm, I'm on the fence. 
I mean, uh, I've, I've mentioned this before. I, when, if I have a look at my watch, that's a dead giveaway that I'm miserable watching a movie. And I never looked at my watch during this, but I think overall, it, yeah, I'm going to stay with the two as well. Uh, I'm going to bump it up to a three. I, you know, my nostalgia for it is too great. And the, the moments, I feel like there are a few moments that bail it out to, there are moments where it can it shows that it can be a lot better movie than it ended up being. I think, you know, again, you've got a lot of raw material there that you're not you're just screwing up. But so I'll say three. And Michael? I'll I'll agree with all that. A three. I mean it's entertaining even when ridiculous. And I mean there's just too much nostalgia in there. And there's a lot of hawk, so that's enough for a three for me. All right, well, let's punch it into our computer that wore tennis shoes. Robert, what do we give Herbie Rides Again? Herbie Rides Again comes in at a 2.81, which is going right. to place it at his number 10 overall out of the movies we have ra- rated uh, 15, uh, 10 out of 15. Okay, so we are lower. Just, just above with one hundredth of a point above freaky friday yeah come on (laughs) love freaky friday but a distant uh i mean jumps up to a 3.31 for splash is is next in line at nine (laughs) what an interesting pairing to be the first time in history those two have probably been ranked against each other in any way whatsoever right (laughs) All right, well, we've ranked it uh, and said what we had to say about it. Michael, what did Leonard Malton have to say about this movie? Leonard Malton gave it two and a half stars. And uh, just just a pretty basic interview or review, called it an okay sequel and typical Disney slapstick. So, darning with faint praise, Leonard Malton. Sounds like he's giving it a, a, a low three, too. So yeah, pretty so much. Um. All right, so before we leave Herbie Rides again, I have a story treatment for you all for the uh, Herbie Cinematic Universe here. Mm. See what you all think. Ned Brainerd has sold uh, you know, his flubber to the national government, or he's licensed it to the <laughs> national government. He's made tons of money. He's run Alonzo Hawk uh, into ruin. Uh, he decides, you know, he's so famous, he decides to get out of uh, Medfield. And he moves to uh, to be a professor at Stanford University to work mm. with his new inventions. Mm. During which time, Alonzo Hawk tracks him down in San Francisco, starts sets up shop there, and uh, Brainerd, wanting to kind of get away from the Hawk thing, uh, decides to put all of his flubber that he has into a Volkswagen he uh, <laughs> finds uh, that uh, he never sees again. And it just goes off into the night. And yeah. He never sees it. No, doesn't know what happened to it. What do you think Flubber. about that? Flubber. 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 Man, it, it's all connected. It works for yeah. me, man. Hey, you, you had me at Hawk. <laughs> Hawk and Hawk. Brainer facing off again. I mean, imagine a yeah, transcontinental Hawk uh, chase down of, of where Brainerd is. That's, that's good stuff. That's yeah. Good stuff. Cross country. Like a Smokey the Bandit kind of thing. That'd yeah. be awesome. Right. Now that's a movie. There's another movie. A Smokey the go. Bandit kind of themed uh, Herbie movie. Yeah. 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 You gonna do what they say can't be done. I, I want somebody else to come up with one for the next one. Hawk Industry sponsors a transcontinental race for some All right, reason. I'm going to work on this one. This, yeah, I'll, I'll, come, I'll cook up something here. And there's a lot of opportunities in the next movie, so. It could be like, you know, the, um, you know, uh, universities, research universities are always doing those like X car challenges to have a car that runs on whatever, you know, solar power car to right, do a that's race true. somewhere. That's true. And uh, the Medfield entry could be, uh, say, Dexter Riley's got an old beat up VW, takes it to Professor Brainerd. Ah. Uh, Professor Brainerd uh, soups it up with some flubber, and that's their entry in the cross country race. That's even better. They get a down on their luck uh, racer named uh, Jim Douglas to do it. That's right. That's right. I got it. I got it. Herbie is parked outside a science building at one of the colleges there, and gets zapped, and gets put 
turns digital and he's in the same world as Tron. <laughs> <laughs> and instead of racing light cycles, they're racing Herbie. <laughs> it's like a Forza, but uh, oh, Herbie's suddenly this. in Forza or something. Yeah. I love this. All right. Oh, man. I'm going to say uh, I want Tommy Kirk in this. Uh, he's, oh, naturally. Um, yeah, he's taking over the family business in some Oh, fashion. so not, not driving Herbie. Right. Bifford. Like, Bifford. He's Bifford. the antagonist. Yeah, Bifford, yeah. It's going to be back. Uh, and he's trying to, you know, him and his father, are, are he's trying to take over the business. And I'm, I'm trying, I haven't, I haven't, I'm still fleshing it out in my mind right now. But that's, I definitely want, I want Bifford and Hawk together again. What if Bifford's back in Hawk City, Missouri? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> he may have gone home. And, uh, working with, with Herbie and Herbie comes into the, into the scenario somehow. Maybe Bifford's running for president. <laughs> And then, I like it. Senator Sen- of Missouri. Yeah, senators, yeah. yeah, that's. And then Herbie runs for, uh, you know, for office as well. Or something. <laughs> Herbie runs for office. Herbie runs again. <laughs> Herbie goes to Washington. <laughs> it's Herbie runs again. Herbie runs again. That's great. So we are halfway through the original series, which means we are heading to the French Riviera next. Jeff, would you be so kind as to introduce the third movie? In our series. Well, I would like to politely defer to my good brother, as this was his uh, vehicle of the Herbie franchise, if he'd like to introduce it. Oh, well, we will be taking a romantic trip across the French countryside with Herbie in the Trans-France race. In Herbie goes to Monte Carlo. I'm very excited. I gotta think this one's gonna this one's gonna get Andy in the right place. This one's gonna for, perk Andy's interest for a, major for a, reason. For a yeah. big reason. Well yeah. well, yeah. I mean, I like movies that take place in Europe. I mean, like Jason Bourne. When every when he was in USA, that was boring. But when he was in Europe, that's when those Bourne movies were really good. So I'm thinking <laughs> it's gonna be very much like that. It's kind of like uh, uh, Madagascar three when they go to Monte Carlo. <laughs> that's like some of the best stuff uh... in the whole series. So. What about when cars went to Europe? Nope. Cars <laughs> nope. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not as cars racist too, as come that. On. So. Right. <laughs> but we are back to racing, so that's good. Yeah. 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 I'm real excited for this cast. Our wonderful graphic designer is busy getting season two artwork to us. I'll add that Todd has made the bold statement saying that the third installment of Herbie is the strongest by far. Why don't you make a bold statement with your graphic needs and hire Todd Napperick? He's good at making bold statements about movie franchises and bold statements with his design work. Let Todd at bindandgraphics.com, that's B-Y-D-A-N-D graphics.com, make your graphics look good. That's what he does, and he might even toss in some film critiques for free. So from all of us to all of you, take care, and we will see you in the south of France. We have mighty red.